pleasure to be here. Would you believe it? It's the first time I've been to Glasgow. And uh, unfortunately, the visit is, is too short, but it's, it's wonderful to see the university. As we walk by the, the room next to it, that I think it's called the Carnegie Room, I was sort of hoping that the lecture would be there. My father's a musician, and he has always wanted me to get to Carnegie Hall, but uh, I'm afraid I never quite uh, lived up to that. My uh, topic today is about a trial that, in fact, as I guess you all realize, didn't take place. Uh, it's, uh, people have speculated about it in recent years, what it might look like, and one of my projects that I hope to complete at some point in the next year or so, I'm not sure I can do it, but my idea is to try and write about the trial, a little bit of counterfactual, a little bit of uh, a mixture of what I'm going to talk to you tonight about, about how the trial was prepared, and then to speculate about what the trial might have looked like. I don't think I'm the first person to do this. I think some Dutch lawyers a few years ago held a mock trial where they attempted to flesh out what that might have been like. But um, I want to do it a little more. I want to add a little bit of fiction. As I say, I, I, I guess I spent perhaps too much of my career in academic writing, and maybe I'm not able to do it. So I'm prepared to give up in a year if I can't get there. But I, I am going to give it a try. And I, what I want to do tonight is share a little bit of my reflection on it and perhaps to try out a few of my ideas about, about what the trial might look like. I know now what an international criminal trial looks like because there are so many of them and I've been close to them and, and watched them at the International Criminal Court, at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the Special Court for Sierra Leone. It's a huge, uh, dare I say, industry now, international criminal justice, a very costly one, representing investments of well over, well over 100 million, probably pretty close to 200 million euro, pounds, dollars, whatever. They're all close to being the same a year, and that's... That's gigantic uh, when we look at the UN budget or international institutions. It's all about prosecuting relatively small numbers of people. And uh, whether we think that maybe there's a, a problem of proportionality there, that there's something that has gone, that, that is a bit awry in the amount that's invested in it, the fact is that states, who are after all the primary motors behind the development of international law, seem to think that it's dreadfully important because they're the ones who put up the money and many of them are democracies and they have taxpayers and so they think it's important. So whether or not we think it's worth all the, the money and the effort, uh, there seems to be a widespread view today that international justice is an important part of international relations, international politics, international governance and the protection of human rights. And it all starts about just about 100 years ago. And that's, that's the story, in, in, if I compress it, of the trial of the Kaiser. Uh, the, um, the idea of international criminal justice, if you look at the textbooks, can actually be traced back a little, several hundred years prior to that. And several, of the, of legal, several legal academics have written citing trials in the Middle Ages in the Holy Roman Empire and there were a few of them, but they were really isolated and they were not the beginning of a movement or of a process. They're more idiosyncratic events than anything that demonstrates some movement or development in international law and international, international institutions. For that, we have to look to the period of the First World War. Uh, I regret not being able to, uh, not having been able to attend the other seminars that, that you held or lectures, because the, the, the broader subject of the lawmaking or the legal development that goes on at the time of the First World War is something that fascinates me greatly, and I would have enjoyed hearing the other uh, lectures, and I hope that there'll be some publications in and around this time of anniversary of the First World War, the centenary of the First World War, where people reflect upon this a little more uh, about the legal development. When we teach human rights, we point to the fact that the, the, the beginnings of human rights institutions can be traced back to the end of the First World War, and there are several 
manifestations of that. One of them is the creation of the International Labour Organization, which is part of the covenant of the League of Nations. Another is the creation of the High Commissioner for Refugees, which dates to the end of the First World War and was there to deal with refugees from uh, uh, Armenian refugees and refugees from the Soviet Union. Um, and the minorities treaties, which were minorities treaties, declarations and agreements which governed much of Eastern Europe and parts of Asia Minor uh, and created uh, when these, when the, particularly the new states such as Poland and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia were created, imposed upon them as a, as a not only a constitutional rule but also part of their uh, international legal obligations, the respect for some fundamental human rights. And so we see these beginnings, not a comprehensive system. There's no universal declaration of human rights that emerges from the League of Nations. But nevertheless, they're the beginnings of then what 25, 30 years later, when the United Nations is being established, becomes a much more comprehensive system, and it's the one that we still have today. Well, another feature of that, and I think it's closely related to the idea of international human rights, which emerges in the aftermath of the First World War, is international criminal justice. From what I can determine, the real starting point of this is a declaration that is made by the uh, governments of Britain, France, and Russia in May of 1915, so exactly 100, 100 years and 10, eight months ago, a declaration where they, they referred to what they called, it's a short declaration, it all fits on a one page of A4, double-spaced, and it was a message that was delivered by the U.S. ambassador to Constantinople, the sublime port, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, as it was, it was then called, uh, delivered to the, uh, to the Turkish rulers, and it referred to, and I quote, these new crimes of Turkey against humanity and civilization. What they're talking about, obviously, are the massacres of the Armenians that had begun about a month earlier in April. I think the 24th of April is the date that, it, that is usually cited of 1915, and that today we describe as the Armenian genocide. The term, the word genocide didn't exist. The word genocide was only invented uh, 30 years later in 1944. So they used this term, new crimes of Turkey against humanity and civilization. There's an early draft. We know a little bit about this. People have studied it in the archives, and there's an early draft of that declaration that talks about these new crimes of Turkey against Christianity and civilization. And somebody crossed out the word Christianity and put in humanity. And I think that transformed everything. Because long prior to, th to that declaration, well before 1915, the, uh, uh, you had treaties and agreements between the Ottoman Empire and European powers that recognized the right of intervention in the Ottoman Empire in order to protect Christian populations. There was nothing novel in the idea that Britain, France, and Russia had some extraterritorial interest in the Ottoman Empire when it came to the Christian populations in the Ottoman Empire. And although the declaration in 1915 was dealing with the Armenians, who were essentially a Christian population, when they changed the term to humanity, it transformed the concept. I doubt that in the foreign ministries of Britain, France, and Russia, they had really thought through the ramifications of this. Because it was one thing to talk about the interest in protecting the Christian populations in the Ottoman Empire. Once you started talking about crimes against humanity, you were suggesting that there was some international interest in how states treat their own populations. That's the essence of what crimes against humanity is. And the problem for the British and the French and the Russians was that they too had subject populations within their countries, within their empires, um, who perhaps they were not being exterminated in the way the Armenians were, but who also had a claim and would later uh, state that claim and make it out and are still doing so. The Kenyans are in court 
uh, in, uh, in uh, London now, suing the British government about the treatment in the 1950s, and there are other examples. I don't, as I say, I don't think they had really realized the consequences of this. But the idea was there. First of all, that it was an international crime called a crime against humanity. They didn't invent the term, by the way. That term had been around for a couple of hundred years. We can now trace this, uh, the origin of the term, through a marvelous research tool called Google Book. You just put the crimes against humanity in inverted commas, and you'll see it. It goes right back from what I can determine. It goes back to the earliest people to use the term were uh, the Italian uh, criminologist, uh, Beccaria, and Voltaire, which is, I think, almost poetic. I love the idea that Voltaire is the first person to use the term crimes against humanity. I don't plan on trying to do any research earlier than that. I want to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. 1915, they talk about it. They have a couple of other notions in the Declaration. One is that they will hold the, uh, the leaders responsible for the crimes and that they will prosecute them when the war is over. And so that's the beginning of the idea that this war, when it's concluded, will, may end in a courtroom. That idea is, is now on the table. It becomes more fashionable as the war is coming to a close and they start to talk about the German emperor, the Kaiser being the target of prosecution. Um, it, it's, it's surprising when one looks at the academic literature, the legal academic literature, there's actually not a lot of discussion about this. One would expect to see law professors in different universities proposing a statute, a code of crimes, and so on. But it doesn't seem that there was a great deal of reflection on how this would, would work in, in practice. I'm sure there were a few lawyers in the foreign ministries who thought about it, but we don't really know much about that. And uh, this is an area, by the way, doctoral students, potential doctoral students. There's a lot still to be done in this, in this area. There's some material that's been written, but there's a great deal that we still don't really know about this seminal period in, in the development of international criminal justice. In late uh, 1918, uh, Lloyd George is elected on a campaign where one of the slogans is, hang the Kaiser. And that idea is, is now, is, it's clear not just with the Ottomans, not just with the leaders of the Ottoman Empire for the massacres of the Armenians, but also the Kaiser is going to be held accountable. And this time, not for his conduct against combatants during the war, or against civilian populations during the war, but for starting the war. And that's going to be, that's the evil, that's the crime that's going to be at the center of the prosecution. When they meet in Paris in early 1919, the war ends, of course, in, in, with the armistice in November of 1918. The Paris Peace Conference is assembled, and it will... I say conclude, the Treaty of Versailles is adopted in June. Uh, it enters into force in July. There are subsequent treaties, and one of them that's important to us is not adopted in Paris until 1920. That's the Treaty of Sevres. That's the treaty with the Turks. But the, the, the most important one is the Treaty of Versailles, and those negotiations then go on in the first half of 1919 in Paris. They immediately establish in January something called the Commission on Responsibilities. And the Commission on Responsibilities is to make a, a determination, which will be a recommendation to those who are actually going to agree on the treaty, about issues of responsibility for the war, who started it, issues of responsibility for violations of the laws of war committed during the conflict, and reparations is because the, the idea that if you can establish responsibility for the war, then that leads to the conclusion that somebody has to pay for it. And that's ultimately going to, that work of that Commission on Responsibilities is going to lead to the proposal for the trial of the Kaiser and also to clauses in the Treaty of Versailles, starting with uh, uh, Article 227, and going to 231, 231 is the reparations clause, 227 to 230, I'm sorry, I said 227, 8, 9, 230, and 231, which is the reparations clause, the one that says Germany's responsible and has to pay 
for starting the war, and therefore they have to pay for all the damage that the war uh, occasioned. And the earlier ones, 227 to 230, govern the prosecutions, the idea not of a state being held responsible, but of individuals being held responsible. They have the negotiations in this committee of, of, on responsibilities. It's composed of 15 members, uh, two members from, the, from the, the important states. There's still very much, well, it's something we still have today with the UN Security Council, but there was the idea that there were great powers and then there were just powers or states. So you have smaller states who are represented there, like Greece, for example, um, and, then you and, and, and then you have the great powers, the United Kingdom and the United States, and Japan is represented. And they discuss war crimes. They discuss the violations that have been committed in the course of the war. It's not an inquiry into violations by everybody. It's violations by those who lost the war. They prepare a list of war crimes. It's the first time this has ever been done. Uh, there have been notions of war crimes in domestic law. There have been prosecutions for war crimes. I mean, we can trace the notion of war crimes back to, back to the Trojan Wars and even before that, uh, to, the, to the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Greek historians. We see notions of war crimes being committed. But in, in international law, this is the first time we see this. And they prepare a list of, of punishable acts that is still with us in a way. That list is still cited. It becomes a reference uh, many years later at Nuremberg when people are saying, well, what are these crimes? Where are they written down? And they say, well, they were written down by the Commission on Responsibilities in its report, which dates from March of 1919. So they develop that body of law. They talk about some of the complex legal issues, like the responsibility of a of a head of state, can a head of state be prosecuted, about the issues of superior orders, about how to join up the dots between the, the prison of, of war camp commander or the submarine, the U-boat commander, and the emperor or the people, how to, how to demonstrate that the guilt uh, can be established at the highest levels even though the crime itself is perpetrated more or less on the, on the battlefield or in a, in a camp. And then they come to, Who's going to do this? And this is, the, in a way, the second big question. And the suggestion is, we'll have an international tribunal. And, and that, in a way, that's the beginning of the international criminal court that we have today. That's really where it, where it starts. Uh, the British uh, Foreign Office uh, show up at the conference, and they actually have a draft of a statute that they've worked out. And I think it's, in, from my research, this is really the first, this is the, this is the ancestor of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. It's not adopted by the Commission on Responsibilities, but it's a basis for discussion, and it addresses some of the difficult issues, again, that I think quite remarkably are still with us today. I watched the International Criminal Court uh, from its, its modern conception in the early 1990s, the negotiations to set up the International Criminal Court. I attended the Rome Conference, and, and what emerged from that, in my understanding, was a, a fascinating political debate about who would control the tribunal. I think it's one that's still going on today. Who would control it? Who would decide who the judges would be? That's important. Who, where would, who would prosecute? And how would the prosecutor decide? Would the, could the prosecutor prosecute anybody, or would some, there be some form of political control over the, over the prosecutor? At Nuremberg, the prosecutors were appointed by their governments. They were instructed by their governments. They weren't independent in any way. And uh, Hartley Shawcross, the British prosecutor at, at Nuremberg, uh, was getting instructions from London on what to do. And so were the other prosecutors. Today, we talk about an independent prosecutor, and we're very proud of that, that the prosecutor doesn't take instructions from anybody. Still, the prosecutor, there's a, a role for the Security Council in the determination of the priorities of the prosecutor, and certainly at the ad hoc tribunals, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, that's the Security Council. The Security Council said, we want you to go there, and we don't want you to go there, and they they make those decisions, and so that means that it's, it's great powers, still, who are, in, in some contexts, 
making those decisions. And so the British draft raises these questions and they go through these complex, these arguments about how will there be a prosecutorial team, will they be elected? And one of the themes we see there, and it continues to the, to the present day, the smaller states, they want to have the judges elected. They want to have some kind of an assembly of the members of the court and they're going to elect the judges and the prosecutors and everybody will get to have their candidates. And the big powers want to have the judges appointed and they want to have seats reserved for the big powers. And that's there in the British draft and it returns again and again. They finally issue a report of the Commission on Responsibilities and they resist the idea that the Kaiser can be prosecuted for starting the war. They're not really convinced. They're not, above all, they're not convinced in law and they realize that there are difficulties with establishing it. And after they issue their report, the Germans issue a report called the White Book and that is issued, that's produced in April. And that's where they state the case saying, you know, this is just a little more complicated than saying the Kaiser declared war and invaded Belgium and Luxembourg and so he started it. And that actually it looks more like uh, an environment in Europe prior to the First World War where everybody was itching for a, for a fight and there was just, was all getting ripe for some huge conflict and this provoked it. And the Germans said, it's true, we invaded Belgium, we shouldn't have done it, we're gonna fix that part. We'll pay reparations, we'll do anything we can, but you can't blame us for everything that happened. When it goes to the Council of Four, the big powers, that's where Woodrow Wilson is, where Lloyd George is, where Clemenceau, now we're, we're outside of the expert level of the Commission on Responsibilities and we're at the top political level. And they reinstate the idea that they're going to prosecute the Kaiser and they talk about prosecuting the Kaiser for crimes against um, the sanctity of, against international morality and the sanctity of treaties. That's the term they use. The crime, the crime of aggression that was being discussed in the Commission on Responsibilities, today anyway, that's language that's familiar to us. And we accept that and there's now a, an amendment to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court that will become operational probably a year from now that will enable the International Criminal Court to prosecute the crime of aggression. But in uh, 1919, uh, and I think, I dare say, the same is true today, if we said, well, we're going to prosecute you for a crime against international morality, um, I think we would really, I don't think that would pass the test of the principle of legality. And it didn't then, and it doesn't now. The sanctity of treaties was a little clearer, and there we had an admission already from Germany. They'd violated Belgian neutrality. They'd agreed to it back in 1830, I think, or 1829. They confirmed it in subsequent treaties and they violated it. But they'd admitted that since 1914, that they'd violated Belgian neutrality. The Kaiser, by this point, so they, they set this up. It's in the Treaty of Versailles. Article 227 says, and they, they actually say, we arraign the Kaiser. So he's actually charged in the treaty. We don't even leave that part of it to judicial uh, independence, where you would have, as we do today, the prosecutor says, we've investigated, here's the charge, judges, do you agree, please confirm the indictment. It's in the treaty, which it says they have the, the um, he's charged with this offense, and they talk about a tribunal being created, and it will be created with judges from the five great powers, and the little countries are not involved, and they say, and we're going to make a call now for him to be handed over to stand trial. The reason they have to do that is they don't have custody of him. And this is, this is the, the problem that ultimately stands in the way of the trial because the, the Kaiser in the last days of the war does a runner. Okay? He gets on his train. Uh, he leaves Berlin because Berlin is, is already in chaos. He lives in Potsdam, just in the suburbs of Berlin. But Berlin is in revolution, essentially, by, by late October and the beginning of November of 1918 and he gets on this train and he goes to the Belgian town of Spa. And Spa is just inside, it's about now less than 10 miles from the border with uh, Germany. And Spa was where the German uh, army had their command staff. That's where the generals were. And so he goes there, spends a few days there and then gets on this train. Finally, I think 
he leaves his train while he's running away and gets in some cars. The train follows, and then they send a train back to get all of his stuff because he has a palace full of stuff in Berlin, and the German government says, okay, you, I think he takes like 200 train car loads of paintings, carpets, furniture, and stuff. Moves it all to the Netherlands, where he's bought a house, and the Dutch queen allows him to come. And the Dutch are a little uneasy about it. They're not sure whether he's really the ideal house guest. But they let him in, and he gets a house in, in a town called Dorn, which is somewhere between The Hague and Utrecht, and stays there for the rest of his life. He lives for another 20-odd years and dies in 1941. By that time, it's Germany. Well, not quite. It's occupied Netherlands. The Germans have reoccupied, have occupied the Netherlands. The Netherlands, I, I should have mentioned, had been neutral in the First World War. And so they, they were out of it. They weren't involved in the war. They took in the Kaiser. And then when the Allies come and say, would you hand him over, the Dutch say, listen, we don't get this crime that you want to charge him with. We don't understand this crime of the sanctity of treaties and crimes against international morality. And so we're not going to extradite him. They say, you know, we might be inclined to go along with an extradition and to have a trial if it was a League of Nations tribunal that had been set up before the crime took place. And that actually prompts uh, immediately, late 1919, early 1920, work within the League of Nations with the idea of setting up uh, an international criminal tribunal or more likely a chamber to do criminal law that would be part of the world court, the permanent court of international justice, which is set up at that time and which uh, still meets today and its new guys in the other Carnegie Hall, the Peace Palace um, in The Hague. Um, and so the, the trial doesn't take place. There's an attempt to capture him. Uh, as I say, this will not only will it make a good book if, if I can pull it off or someone else may do it, but it will make a pretty good film too. Because at, at one point, some cowboyish American major or lieutenant or something like this decides that he's going to catch the Kaiser. And they actually, he gets a little group of people and they go into the Netherlands and they try to capture him. And they show up at the house. They actually get into the house, but he has some guards there, and they finally talk them down, and the Americans get back in their, they didn't have jeeps then, but whatever the equivalent were, got back on their horses and, and got out of the Netherlands before they were arrested and, and thrown in jail. But you can see that would make a pretty good scene um, in, a, in a film. And so the, the trial doesn't take place. Let me just... Uh, Briefly, scope up. Well, there's one other piece of this that I, I want to share with you, and, and then I'll just tell you a few of my ideas of what, of what the trial might have looked like. There is, following the adoption of the report on the Commission on Responsibilities, there, there are more treaties that have to be negotiated. The next big treaty that they, they deal with at the Paris Peace Conference is the treaty with Bulgaria. Bulgaria was also on the side of the Germans and the Austrians, in the war, and so they have to develop this treaty. It becomes the Treaty of uh, saint germain en laye when it's adopted. They're all named after palaces around, around Paris, all of the treaties. And so that one is negotiated, and when it's being negotiated, the Greek ambassador who's there, his name is Nikolaos Politis. Politis has been part of the Commission on Responsibilities. He has fought very hard for the the smaller country version of the International Criminal Tribunal, one that's going to be more democratic, where all the small countries are going to participate. And he says, you know, we didn't adopt this when it came to the Germans, and the, and the great powers control that because of political differences you had. But he said, in this case, first of all, the Americans aren't interested at all. This is dealing with Bulgaria. They weren't at war with Bulgaria. He said, this is really something the victims of the war with Bulgaria were the Greeks, the Serbs, and the Romanians. And he said, and we all agree. We all agree. We'd like to have, a, we'd like to have an international criminal, a truly international criminal tribunal. And they make the proposal, and they adopt it, and then they agree with him. He carries the day. And then it goes to the political level, and the Americans just say, forget it. We're not going to do it. 
And the reason was that by doing that, they would make their earlier decision of a tribunal that was run by the great powers look bad. And they said, we're not going to do that. And so the, finally, the, the clauses in the Versailles Treaty, uh, not the part about the emperor, because we don't have the emperor with, uh, with Bulgaria, but the other clauses dealing with war crimes prosecutions are simply copy and paste and put into that treaty. But there's one other, the final treaty, which is not copy and paste. And that's the one with the Turks. That's the Treaty of Sevres. And the Treaty of Sevres is not adopted until the middle of 1920. So uh, after the, the treaty with the Bulgarians is finalized and adopted, they move on to talk about the Treaty of Sevres. The Americans go home. They're not interested at all. They weren't at, at war with, with Turkey. So this involves the British. It involves the French and countries like, like Greece. And they come up with an original body of clauses in the Treaty of Sevres that talk about, they're not, again, going to try the emperor, but they talk about holding the Turks responsible for the massacres that took place on their own territory. So this isn't starting the war, and this isn't war crimes committed against combatants on the other side. This is about persecuting your own civilian population. This is the follow-up to the 1915 Declaration. And they say, we're going to prosecute those cases. And we will prosecute them, uh, if possible, before the League of Nations court, if it's set up. So it's a fascinating article in the Treaty of Sevres. It never comes into force, never, because the Turks refused to accept the treaty. Unlike the Treaty of Versailles, which the Germans agreed to. Later they said, we didn't really agree to it. But they did sign and ratify it. And that was always the answer to the question, why, why did you go along with it? They had actually accepted the Treaty of Versailles initially. The Turks didn't. And so that treaty is, was, never comes into force, and those clauses never come into force. What, when I say we don't know, I don't know. Maybe I haven't found the doctoral thesis or the book where someone wrote about it. But I've read everything that I can on the subject, and I think I've done fairly thorough research, and nobody seems to know how that clause got there in the, in the Treaty of Sevres. My thesis about it is that I, I see the fingerprints of Nikolaos Politis, the Greek guy. I think he's involved. We know he's involved in the negotiations. But as I say, I've looked at all the books and the material and nobody seems to know. And I've been to uh, the British archives in, in Kew looking for the records of the negotiations and can't find them either. So that's a chapter of this part about the beginning of international justice that, that, that still remains to be written and perhaps one of the, the more interesting ones in terms of uh, today, modern times, because that's the part of it that in a way interests us the most, are the atrocities committed against your own population and how that idea was discussed and how that germinated and what they thought they were going to do. What would the trial have looked like? So these are, I'll just throw out a few of the ideas that I have about, about trying to imagine a trial of the, of the Kaiser and how it would turn out. First of all, there, we'd have to figure out where it would be. My idea is the Dutch say, you can't have them, but if you want to hold the trial, come here. So it would be held in Carnegie Hall in the Netherlands, in the Peace Palace, which was built by, with Carnegie's money, and it's the lovely building that now houses the international Court of Justice. So I can see the Kaiser driving up in his, uh, he actually had motor cars. He apparently had quite a collection. He was a collector of motor cars and he would be driven up. I don't think he had to be in detention. He couldn't run anywhere. There was nowhere for him to go. So I would leave him free during the trial and he would show up and drive up in his vehicle every day and attend the trial. There would be really a fascinating debate about who started the war. There would also be questions, of course, about uh, his responsibility for various violations that took place in the war. And there's no shortage of information about that. The U-boat warfare, the sinking of hospital ships, uh, and atrocities that took place in the first months of the war during the invasion of Belgium. Uh, attacks on cultural property, the burning of the library at Louvain, um, and the, the, the killing of uh, civilians in the, in the Belgian town. So there's, there's a lot of material, and that would all nourish also a discussion about this, these early days about 
crimes and who would be responsible and so on. Of course, we'd have to have some personalities. We'd have to have some people to put on the, on the bench. So I'd put my friend Politis, Nicolaus Politis, would be one of the judges on the bench, and we'd have to identify a few others, uh, maybe some known figures and maybe a few imaginary ones. A friend of mine in The Hague the other day was telling me about a defense lawyer who he knew very well. He said, I worked with him. He said, he said that trial dragged on, and he loved it dragging on. Now, the, the, the trials in The Hague, as you know, take a long time. And getting people to try and end them quickly is like, it's a bit like getting turkeys to vote for Christmas, actually. Nobody wants them to end because they're all earning money. Their jobs end when the trial ends. But he said, not with this guy. He said, this guy liked it because he didn't really get along that well with his wife, who was in London. And he had a lot of extracurricular activity going on there in The Hague. He said, I used to have to deliver things to him at his, at his home. And every night, there was a different woman in the flat. And uh, there was another guy who worked with him. And he was gay. And every night, there was a different guy in the flat. So there was some, so I, I have to have a, a, someone with this you know, a defense lawyer with this profile or somebody involved in it. Um, parts about the personality of the Kaiser was an intriguing character. There have been huge, there, there's a massive two-volume biography of him that appeared, Cambridge University Press was actually written in German first and has been published in translation a few years ago that talks about him and what a complex person he was, um, the grandson of the Queen Victoria, of course, the cousin of George V, first cousin of George V, and uh, someone who definitely in his final years became a very, very nasty man. And we know now that after the war, while he's there in the Netherlands, first of all, he is dreaming of returning to power. He's convinced that he's going to get back in power, and he tells us to everyone who will listen when he gets back in power, all of the people who removed him from power and betrayed him, he's going to kill them all. And he starts, he, he, he sounds like Hitler, really, when you read his, the, the, the things he was saying. He's terribly anti-Semitic. He wants to remove all of the Jews from, from Germany. He sees them, and he sees the First World War and his removal from power as being a conspiracy of Jews and Freemasons. So he, he's, and, and he thinks that when Hitler comes to power, that he's sort of, he's there. So Hitler, maybe now you need an emperor again, but Hitler actually doesn't want to have an emperor Alongside Hitler, he thinks he's the emperor. So there's no room for the Kaiser, and he remains there in, in the Netherlands. But there are things to say about his, his personality. Then the, the final part, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, the, the counterfactual. I, I, I don't think that this should be necessarily a discussion about whether the world would have changed. I think maybe it's better just to discuss what the trial would be like, and then to assume that the world then continued as it had. But it is interesting to speculate on that. I think maybe doing that would be a little too uh, self-serving in terms of, uh, because people in the international criminal justice field uh, like to think that they are transforming the, the world, that the handful of trials that we have in the, for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda and at the International Criminal Court have just absolutely changed the, the world as we know it. And I, I think that's probably an exaggeration. I'd like to think that, and I'm prepared to continue to work for the, um, for the effects that international justice can have on conflicts, on ending conflicts, on preventing conflicts. Um, but I'm sufficiently skeptical about, about, about it to resist, want to resist the idea that somehow history would have been that we would rewrite, rewrite history. But it is tempting to want to end it with some disgruntled corporal in Munich uh, looking at the trial and, and saying, you know, I've read the transcript and I think actually the emperor was guilty and I'm going to go back to art school in Vienna. Um, it, it, it would be fun to, to do that as well, but I, I think I will not follow that path. There you have it, the trial of the, the Kaiser. Um, it's, uh, th there are many other people we can think of who might have been put on trial. I think people have done, I know they've done the trial of Napoleon, but as you know, he wasn't put on trial. Um, and uh, uh, so this was really the first time, and, and people looked at Napoleon 100 years ago. It was, it was about 100 years. It was an anniversary as well, and said, 
you know, we put them on an island. And there were those who said they should do that, that they should put the Kaiser on an, on an island. Um, and people looked at that and said, no, we, we, won't, we, won't, uh, we won't do that. We'll have a, a trial. And when the idea of trials returns in the Second World War, then again, there's a debate about what to do with the leading Nazis and those who are responsible for the Nazi atrocities in the war. And there are opinions that are expressed at the highest levels. Churchill's on record saying something along these lines. So is Stalin. And so are some American officials, that they just carry out summary executions of the Nazi leaders. Um, there's a, a document from the Foreign Office that was issued in April of 1945 that they send to the Americans, it's published, it's, not, it's, it's well known, where they said, we're not convinced about this idea of an international trial at Nuremberg, we think maybe we should just execute them all. And uh, um, that idea, of course, is dropped, but to me, once they had put that on paper in 1919, that a trial was what you had to do, there was no turning back, actually, that they had changed the agenda to the extent that when there was an, another world war and in the future, it was there. There were there was no longer it was no longer an option to take someone, dump them on an island, and leave them there until they died, or to or or to carry out summary executions as had been done, or to leave the crimes unpunished and not do anything. Um, that that justice had become, and this was the beginning of it. That this was now part of the landscape, uh, unavoidable, and and I think that that's that's borne out over the last 100 years. It's an imperfect system. Uh, it doesn't always work. It's still very limited. We're still learning how to do it. But um, we won't reverse that part of it. That part of history was changed by the trial of the Kaiser, even if it never actually took place. Thank you. I certainly had two epiphanies uh, this evening listening uh, to Bill. Coming from Germany and having pictures of the Kaiser in mind, cowboys chasing the Kaiser is something that takes getting used to. Um, but I think Bill's talk was also a forcible, forceful reminder um, of how much of the thinking that I usually associate only with Nuremberg and exclusively with Nuremberg actually dates back to 1919. So much of the conceptual framework and, and the things that are being discussed today were laid out uh, after the First World War and not for the first time after the Second World War. In a way, if you look at this from this perspective, you could even argue international criminal law hasn't developed all that much. It has just been better operationalized over time. A lot of the framework was set in 1919. Now, we're in the very fortunate position not only to have Bill here, but to have him available to take a set of questions. The floor is open, um, and please don't feel obliged to limit yourself just to the historical dimension. Uh, Bill is happy to accept uh, questions from a broader range uh, of topics. Peter. Thank you very much. That was an excellent talk, and I don't really have a question. I just wanted to tell you about a document I found years ago in the French archives. It was a note from Paul von Hindenburg, who had, uh, along with Ludendorff, kind of run a kind of a the dictatorship in Germany uh, with the last couple of years of the war. And it was to Ferdinand Fasch, who was the Allied Supreme Commander. And I think it was written, but I can't prove this, by uh, a, German, a German international lawyer. But it's a very sophisticated critique of the basis for, for uh, prosecuting the Kaiser, arguing that it was at variance with all the democratic uh, democratization, all, the, all that discourse about the people being separate from their sovereign and the, uh, the critique of this idea of, you know, autocracy and, and, the, and the, the sovereignty of a, 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 a sovereign ruler, uh, a Kaiser. And I found that very interesting because one of the justifications, I suppose, for, or one of the reasons why there was such a groundswell of, of uh, enthusiasm for charging, for prosecuting the Kaiser, was because the war had been so unprecedentedly horrific that there was a sense that somebody had to be <coughs> held responsible. But Hindenburg's note 
was a really sophisticated critique using political theory, and especially invoking allied political theory, to, uh, to, to criticize the basis of that. But thanks very much. Your talk was fantastic. There's a, there's a, a document by some German scholars that's in the German uh, white book that comes out in April of 1919 that attempts to answer the various, the legal arguments, but you know, you could see the, probably wouldn't have got very far in the, in the trial itself. It's like in, the, in 1945, Carl Schmidt writes a long critique that he submits that he, he gives to the Nazi defendants and tries to help them out, but he writes in there somewhere saying this probably isn't gonna work. Uh, It was a very interesting presentation, thanks very much. I'm just curious in your perspective, I was thinking when you were speaking as to whether there's an either or kind of going on in here, because you talked about reparations on the one hand <coughs> and trying the protagonists on the other, and they didn't try the protagonists, but obviously they went for reparations. I mean, they rebuilt northern France by taking a lot from Germany. But that clearly didn't work, because 20 years they were back at war again, because Germany had been impoverished. Was that the lesson then that they learned at Nuremberg, that rather than continuing to go to Germany for reparations, instead they tried the protagonists, and that was the either or, and that was the, as, as probably as history has shown us, was the better approach? It seems to have worked better <laughs> after 1945, uh, certainly. <laughs> Uh, it's a f the, the, the relationship between uh, holding this, this collective responsibility that's the, in the nature of reparations where you're making the state pay and, you're, uh, and, and it, was, it was huge, although they, they did at different occasions over the next decade or so compromise on the, on the reparations that were originally part of the, of the plan. And then holding individuals responsible is, is uh, there's, a, there's a great... There's a tension in it, and there's a suggestion that when you hold the individuals responsible, you, you let the, those in the public who are not entirely responsible and guilty, you're, you're acknowledging their role, the, differ the difference in the role and the importance of the, of the two of them. So there's something there, and, and I, I suppose people looking back will say, we did it better in 1945 than we did in 1919. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I want to pick up on Robin's point about, well, maybe things haven't actually changed a whole lot since 1919, maybe we've just implemented a bit better. Um, and, and I want to say that it, it seems to me that throughout this entire period from 1919 onward, we see how much all of this is, is embedded within power. I mean, 1919, who was it that was making the decision? It was, it was the victors. It was victim justice. There was no pre-existing um, court to, to try this person, as, as is pointed out. Nuremberg, again, victor justice, power. It's the people who won who are making the decision. Today, International Criminal Court is independent, but it's still connected to the Security Council. And this, the prosecutor still has to count out to presidents and prime ministers and places where he or she wants to um, um, undergo investigation. And as you pointed out, again, the ICTY, ICTR, again, power. And, and, and so I'm wondering, is it possible to get away from that? And does this undermine all these wonderful ideas of justice that we have when everything is so much embedded within power? That's a... Yeah, I was going to say that's another lecture, really, another talk to, 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 to deal with that problem properly. The, um, the, the decisions about whom to prosecute, whether it's the Kaiser in the Treaty of Versailles, uh, or the Turkish rulers in the Treaty of Sevres, or at Nuremberg, and subsequently the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda and Sierra Leone, that decision has a strong political component. The, the Kaiser, he's there in the treaty. There's, they, can't, they can't come back and say, well, we changed our mind. We're going to prosecute someone else under Article 227 of the, of the Versailles Treaty. It's impossible. He's the one. At Nuremberg, we don't specify who's going to be prosecuted, except they have to be part of the leadership of the Axis powers. 
So it does narrow the list of suspects considerably, and it puts a lot of people in the clear. They're not going to be, they can't be prosecuted at Nuremberg. And to make sure that nobody gets, misunderstands that, the prosecutors themselves, who, who decide whom to prosecute, are uh, agents of the governments that are running the tribunal. So it, it's under tight political control. Uh, the more recent, contemporary, modern day iterations of that, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, the prosecutor is apparently independent, but the prosecutor has a limited choice because the, the situation that the prosecutor is to prosecute, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, that's determined politically. So what we have with the International Criminal Court, and it's of course the, the beauty of it, in theory, is that we have an independent prosecutor who is not controlled by that, and not even controlled by the United Nations Security Council, because she has the power. If the Security Council says, we want you to prosecute there, she can say, I don't want to. I'm not going to do it. And there's a little bit of judicial review of that decision, but basically she's running the show. And that creates another package of problems, because once you, it's one thing to have a political involvement, and we can see the drawbacks and the problems with the credibility of the institution when it's it's determined politically. Once you remove that, uh, what do you put in its place? Uh, and what we put in its place domestically is we, we have a DPP, we have a director of prosecutions, and say, you prosecute every serious crime. And by the way, if you don't prosecute a serious crime, we'll have an inquiry and you'll lose your job for not doing it. So we're very, you know, but we expect that all here in Glasgow, someone reports a murder, you're not going to have the prosecutor saying, well, what side of town did that take place on? Because I'm not dealing with that side of town this year. I'm, I'm working on another part of town. Or I'm dealing with another category of crimes this year. We expect all serious crimes to be prosecuted. But the International Criminal Court can't do that. It's, it's finished its first decade. It's, done a, it's finished three trials in a decade. It's a fourth one will finish. Won't, it won't even finish. We'll have the trial judgment, and then we'll have two or three years for the appeal. So it can't deal with all of them. So who picks? And that's the prosecutor. And finally, we don't quite know how those decisions are made. You know, is it, is there some, there's, there's of course analysis and the crimes are all serious, but what we don't know is why other crimes don't get on the list and why other people aren't prosecuted. And I'm not sure if we've, you know, it's like a pendulum that swung too far in the other direction now where we don't have any policy or political guidance for the, for the prosecutor, it, it, it's, it's got its own flaws, that system. And, and that part is not resolved by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. There was someone else in the back. As I understand the charge against the Kaiser, as it was worded, it was a, it was a violation of international morality. And I wondered if that tells us something about the way international criminal law is inclined um, when compared with other areas of international law. It's not just a question of the language. The whole thing, the whole um, project, inclines towards this kind of indictment, moral or whatever. So, and I, so I wondered if you had something, a comment on that. And secondly, I wondered why the 1907 uh, Hague Conference and what came out of it and what had been agreed um, and what was on record about the performance of a number of states in the First World War um, wasn't brought up. It was the first war where we had um, credible observers, as I understood, who, who, who really had been commissioned by some pretty formidable organisations. And at the same time, we had the International Committee of the Red Cross. All these things that we're learning uh, uh, about in international um, law now, I wondered why some of these um, um, facilities, instruments that were in place, d didn't come up more. And why they don't come up in discussions of that whole episode, you very rarely read although you would, as you said, there is very little written on, on that whole thing. But, but you never um, read in some of the accounts that, that are uh, um, around anything about the, 
you know, the, the Hague laws. And mm. it, it just seems peculiar if we had them. Why weren't they playing much more of a role after the First World War as, as the fingers were being pointed? The, the Hague Conventions do come up in the discussions. There were two conventions, there were two Hague conferences, one in, in 1899 and one in 1907, and they developed a, a number of, of treaties, of which the, the, the one that is most important in terms of the war crimes part of it is the, uh, the, is the, the fourth convention of, of 1907. Um, and there was to be a third Hague conference in 1915. But that, of course, didn't take place because of the war. And when they prepare the list in the Commission on Responsibilities of War Crimes, they're definitely looking at the Hague Convention. They're inspired by the list in the, in the fourth Hague Convention, and they, and they use that. And that comes up again in the Second World War in the prosecution. So it's definitely a part of it. Of course, it doesn't say anything about international morality, although it does have the famous what's called the Martins Clause, which is in the preamble of the Hague Conventions, um, that, that says in the absence of a more thorough codification, the participants in the conflict will be guided by the principles of humanity. Um, I can't remember it by heart, but the whole that's, that's the idea. And people often point to that, saying that's the origin of the notion of crimes against humanity. Not quite, but, but it's not irrelevant either to the discussion. But the Hague Convention doesn't deal with the starting the war part of it. And, and that's, it's hugely important also for the future because that becomes also the core of the charges at Nuremberg, crimes against peace count, uh, is, is the glue that binds together all the other war crimes charges at, at Nuremberg. And of course, it's also part of a, a more complete legal development that we start to see emerging with the League of Nations, but that finally isn't complete until the, the Charter of the United Nations that prohibits the use of force for the settlement of international disputes. And, and the League of Nations won't quite, doesn't quite get there, and, and it takes another, takes another nasty war uh, and, and to learn the, the lesson to do that more completely, just as Nuremberg is a more complete version of these uh, tentative efforts at the beginning. Uh, on, on the charge, the idea of the international morality and the sanctity of treaties, when the, when the Dutch uh, turned down the request to send the Kaiser, uh, Clemenceau sends a little note to the Dutch that we have. And Clemenceau says, the, the French um, prime minister, president, president, I guess, I can't remember what he was, one of the two. And Clemenceau sends a note back. He's, he's in charge in France. And he says, you know, this bit about international morality, it's really just kind of a vague political charge. And uh, which doesn't actually make the Dutch any happier. They say, well, that's a, kind of what we thought it was. So you've just confirmed it. And that's not why we're going to send them. Um, but that's also, and maybe that's something to be dealt with in the, in the book about the trial of the Kaiser, is uh, there would be a dissatisfaction, I think, by judges and defense lawyers and prosecutors about that that would compel them then, probably, that would have compelled them to develop a more principled legal notion about, about what, what the evil was, what the wrong was. And, and that starting a war of aggression, if he started it, which is the factual question that you'd, you would have to address, but that that itself was the, was the, was the evil that, that had to be dealt with. That's what public opinion thought. That's what everybody believed. There were, they wanted to get even for all kinds of various violations within the conflict. But you're quite right. It was this idea, or someone else said this. You no, know, they had just been through. This was the greatest self-inflicted wound that Europe had ever done to itself since, since the beginning uh, of, uh, we think, what, 20 million deaths in four, in four years. Um, young men here today, if we were 100 years ago, about half of you would be buried in northern France, probably. I mean, it's very hard for us to understand just how devastating it was. And it was a case, too, that we don't see so much with modern wars, but lots of the leaders, too. Lots of these people who were there actually negotiating in Paris and making the agreements, they had sons who were, who were buried or who were, who were maimed and, and permanently disabled. And, and so there was, there was a lot of anger 
uh, about, about dealing with it. And, uh, and there was a sense that, that it was the war itself. And they returned to that in 1945. And then that message that it's the war itself that's the, that's the wrong, that is the evil, that we lose sight of for 60 years or so. And when the Yugoslavia Tribunal was set up in the 1990s, there is not even a crime of crime against peace or of aggression in the statute. That's only now coming back to the Rome Statute. Amendments were adopted in 2010, and they, they technically came into force in 2013, but they don't become operational until next year. And even then, they have a limited scope. So that, you know, that message has, has been diluted in a way. Although, again, and maybe this is part of the looking back on the lawmaking uh, the lessons that are learned and the legal progress that's happened as a result of the First World War, but also the Second World War, um, is that uh, the, the prohibition on the use of force it hasn't been perfect, but we haven't had a world war for, uh, for 70 years either, and that's a, not a bad accomplishment given the, the history of this continent. We could take one more question. I, I may just bring it back to the International Criminal Court. And just, it was last week, I think, they announced that the Kosovo Tribunal will start. And I, just in light of what you were saying about the International Criminal Court, and that they only managed to solve three cases in the last 10 years, do you think it's a good idea to have a separate tribunal for each of these events? or? Would it be better to bring the Kosovo Tribunal and the proceedings under the International Criminal Court umbrella? It's become, uh, when the International Criminal Court was, was first, when the Rome Statute was adopted in 1998 and then when it entered into force in 2002, people, I think a lot of people had a vision that this was going to be now one-stop shopping for international justice. And there's a recognition now that that's just totally unrealistic. And I think probably we, we should uh, encourage specialized institutions where they're necessary because the International Criminal Court is, is incapable of doing uh, that kind of concentrated work where you have, uh, as it did in Yugoslavia and Sierra Leone and, and Rwanda. It's not, it's not the right place for it and it's not equipped to do it. That said, I mean, if I had to think of the... Uh, the bad things that have happened on the planet over the last uh, 25 years, uh, body snatching in Kosovo wouldn't be at the top of the list, actually. And uh, the, the other tribunal, the one that's actually the most sumptuous, luxurious tribunal in The Hague, I haven't referred it to it yet because it, it sort of sticks in my throat even to mention its name. This is the special tribunal for Lebanon which is, is actually the richest of all of the tribunals. And they have a trial that's been going on for years now. Uh, and it's dealing with a single assassination of uh, a former Lebanese prime minister, Rafik Hariri. Um, they don't have any accused there. We don't even know whether they're alive. It's all being done. It's, you know, some of you are law students, right? You, you know what a moot court is? Well, this is the biggest moot court ever. It's, it's the criminal lawyer's dream because you have, some, you have a whole phalanx of well-paid international criminal lawyers and they don't have any clients. So it's fantastic. You, know, you don't have someone calling you in the middle of the night complaining, asking you to get them out of jail or something. They just make it up. And this trial goes on and on and on. International criminal justice, I think what happened in the 1990s was that we... We developed these systems, Rwanda, and Yugoslavia, and Sierra Leone. We created a huge kind of a market for it. People trained in it, skilled in it, who want to work as judges, prosecutors, clerks, defense counsel, <laughs> investigators. And now it's, it's taken, I, just, I can only call it a, kind of an idiosyncratic turn, where we go to weird places. Now, I don't mean that Kosovo is a weird place, but I mean, the, 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 it's just not... It shouldn't be at the top of the list there, and it doesn't justify all the, all the attention, and nor does, does Lebanon. Those, 
those resources should be invested in places where it's important. And there are several candidates at the International Criminal Court, and unfortunately, political reasons have kept them away from it. Uh, and, and as you know, the International Criminal Court has been totally focused on Africa. Um, again, dealing with minor, mostly minor, secondary figures who no one's ever heard of before. And there are two convictions. It's not just that they've only convicted two people. The two guys, one of them got a 12-year sentence and the other guy got a 14-year sentence. How serious is that? You know, that's what you get in the United States for smuggling three joints of marijuana. You know, it's like not... It, and on the Richter scale of atrocity, it just isn't, isn't there. And so uh, that's sort of my reflection on the, the Kosovo thing. There, I was in The Hague earlier this week. There are a lot of people who are very happy about the establishment of the Kosovo Tribunal, not just the people who work in the tribunals, but the hotel operators and the restaurants and the taxi drivers. Well, can I just ask with a view to the future and really in concluding uh, now, uh, would you share your thoughts where you see, if any, uh, the next big mega trend of international criminal law, or are we just entering a phase of stabilization, consolidation of what we've achieved so far, or will we eventually see a crime of aggression for starting civil wars uh, or any other uh, future trend that you see or would like to see? I think what we're, we have the potential for this happening, but I wouldn't want to, I, I would place a small bet on this, but I wouldn't want to invest my house in this happening. But I, I do see it starting to happen. I felt that the first decade of the International Criminal Court was disappointing and that the court was a, a mediocre institution. Um, it was, sometimes it performed well in terms of it, its limited ambitions, but that it was really dealing with isolated conflicts in Africa and with, it wasn't at the, at the core of our concerns in the way, well, you know, if you had an international criminal court in June of 1945, just set it up in 1945 and someone said, I wonder what we should prosecute. It wouldn't be too hard to answer that question. It wouldn't have been too hard in January of 1919 if you just, well, now we've got this new international criminal court, what would we deal with? So we have this new international criminal court in the, 19, in the 2002 and it becomes operational the next year. And where do they go? Ituri and Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo and Northern Uganda and some, and they're not at the core of our great international concerns. This is changing, you know, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, the new pro the second prosecutor, has changed. If you go onto the website of the International Criminal Court now, you see two parallel lists. One is the list of countries where the court is actually conducting investigations and prosecutions. And the other, we, it's called the preliminary examination list. You could call it the wish list. It's the cases where they might prosecute. It's very interesting that they even have it up there. It's a bit of a naming and shaming exercise. It's more like a human rights institution. And on the list on the, on the left, the countries where they're operating, well, it's basically all Africa, Central Africa. That's where it is. And that's a big shortcoming in the court. And it's one that's actually um, disturbed uh, its uh, relationship with Africa, which began very favorably and now has a, has, is a troubled relationship. But the list on the right is really interesting because you have about the same number of countries and it's not just the countries that are there but it's the ones that are, how should I put it? It's like rocks or stones there and you have to lift them up because there's always another country underneath the stone. So you have Afghanistan up there. Afghanistan is a state party. Uh, so they're investigating in Afghanistan but the prosecutor issued a report in November, a few months ago, saying, well, by the way, in Afghanistan, I'm investigating the activities of the United States of America. Well, it's not on the list. It's, you don't see its name there, but it's there. And then underneath, there's Iraq. But it's not Iraq that's being investigated. Iraq isn't a state party. They can't investigate anything that happens in Iraq. They can only investigate crimes committed by nationals of a state party to the Rome Statute. So you lift up the stone of Iraq and there's the United Kingdom. And if you've been following in the last week or two, lots of news, the, the Iraq historical, uh, what's it called, the I-Hat historical 
Allegations Commission or something, has just, their head has just said, we're, we've given notice to hundreds of former soldiers, warning them that there may be investigations. There's, there's stuff going on, which is all to the good. Nobody's going to be convicted of anything they didn't do, but the investigations are going on, and that's a result of the prosecutor of the International Court, Criminal Court, taking that up. And then you get to Palestine. I don't need to tell you whose name is written on the other side of the stone dealing with Palestine. And then we have uh, uh, Ukraine. And guess who's on the bottom of the stone of Ukraine? And Georgia and the same other country. Three, imagine that. So for the first time now, we have on the list of international criminal justice, either explicitly or implicitly, more than 20 countries including three permanent members of the Security Council. And that's fantastic, I think. That's never happened before, and that was our dream in the 1990s of an institution, was that it would be the kind of court that would hold accountable the powerful and not just the small and weak. And so it's moving in that direction. What I don't know is whether they have the guts to carry through with it, but I want to encourage them. And uh, I think that that's... It's got the potential there. And this is, of course, the, you know, it's kind of the mystery, the enigma of, of criminal justice and international criminal justice. You never quite know when you start to pull on the thread how it's going to, who's going to end up in the dock. So stay tuned. I don't know. People want to see, you know, Blair or, uh, or uh, Bush or Netanyahu. I don't know. We'll see. Hold your breath. I'm not going to make any predictions now. <laughs> Two more very quick points. Point number one, we're now going to conclude and we're going to have a reception outside to which all of you are very warmly welcomed. And before we move there, please join me in thanking our speaker for a fantastic talk tonight. Thank you.